Hey everybody, welcome back for another Instagram Live Happy Hour with 90 Second Beer Review. Uh, tonight we're going to be having uh, Glass Jug Beer Lab on from Durham, North Carolina. We're going to have Chris Creech, who's the co-owner and uh, head brewer at Glass Jug. Um, we're going to be trying a couple of uh, cool beers, talking a little bit about uh, Glass Jug and kind of the history there and what they're up to. Uh, and then getting a special sneak peek of their new downtown tap room, which has not even opened yet. So uh, let's get Glass Jug in here and uh, we'll drink some beers and talk a little bit about what they've got going on. All right, let's see if we can get this to work. I feel like every week it takes, takes a couple tries before we get to work. Hey, there we go. Still, so looks like we're still loading. Like, oh, there we go, Chris. How you doing? Hear me now? Yeah, we can hear you. Let me turn my volume up a little bit. There we go. Awesome. I think I think you officially uh, set the record for the fastest to be able to figure out how to get in here and get up on video. Um, <laughs> we well, that's impressive. This is the first time I've ever done an Instagram live. So uh, <laughs> yeah, we've, gonna... we've had a few that have taken a couple of minutes before we figured them out. Um, but uh, welcome. Thanks for, uh, for taking some time to join us tonight. Hey, man. Happy to do it. Um, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pour this, uh, this new – actually, this is the wrong one. Uh, I'm going to pour this new beer. But before I do, why don't you uh, give everybody a quick introduction to yourself and Glass Jug? Yeah. Um, yeah. As, as Howard mentioned, I'm Chris Creech. I'm with Katie. Um, yeah, we opened it. Um, we are about to open a new tap room, which is where I'm at now, as, as I imagine was just mentioned. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, so I, uh, I run the production. So I am um, primarily in charge of the brewing of our beer, um, whereas Katie primarily oversees our tap rooms with an S now. Uh, <laughs> but uh, in addition to, to brewing and overseeing our, our brewing staff, I uh, do all the other that nobody wants to do. So uh, that's, uh, that's where I pick up and do things like install TVs and speakers at, uh, at the new tap room. Sounds fun. So you got to play AV guy, uh, AV guy for a day. And uh... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about this new beer that literally just uh, got canned today, right? Yesterday? Here's this morning. I, I've got a short fill, no label, but same beer. Um, I might as well pour some if we're going to talk about it, right? I was saying it's got that uh, that nice uh, kind of deep golden light amber, mostly clear. Clear. That's my that's my glass steaming up out here. Look at yeah. that. Yeah, it should be transparent. Hence the yep. name. <laughs> we're in trouble at that point. <laughs> uh, we're sweating. Sometimes it takes just to, just until we can it before it drops clear, but it always does. Um, yeah, so transparency is um, a, it's been a series that we've been playing around with for a while. Um, we've tried out a bunch of different hop profiles with it. We've played with different grain bills. I've tried different yeast. Um, all and, and with the purpose of taking different spins on what is an American IPA. Mm -hmm. uh, some more dry, you know, lighter in color. This one is more kind of your, I think, as to be expected for a West Coast IPA. It's a little more on the orangey side. Um, we actually had some side by side with uh, Bell's Two Hearted today, and they are like exactly the same color. Um, Similar hot profile, actually. They use primarily Centennial. This one is um, Centennial with some Amarillo and Citra thrown in. I'll say they're, they're, they're famous for that. Isn't that one 100% Centennial? Yeah, so it's, you know, slightly different character, but this one is, is dry hopped with Centennial and Amarillo. Um, but yes, yeah, so we played with the series for a few years now, um, doing some like drier, crisper um, West Coast IPAs. We've done some with more like wheat in the body to give it a little bit of feel. We've played with bitterness and just all different tastes and it's been fun um but we finally decided you know it's, it's become such a popular series we wanted to make this one of our first year-round beers we have for three we've been brewing for three years and we've never had any beer year-round um, and, and just to confirm th so this one that was canned this is now officially the year-round version of transparency that is correct yeah you can get it on on, version, on draft at um our rtp tap room and will be on drafting downtown and then um, and is in cans we kind of revamped uh revamped the label a little bit um so you'll see most of the other ones would say like you know modern transparency mm -hmm. or this one is, is just uh just transparency 
Um, so this will be one of our, our first year round beers. Um, we hope to have it available in cans pretty much all the time. Um, now it's possible we sell out between batches. There may be short stints where we don't have it. Um, already, you know, shout out to, to Jason, who's going to be managing our new tap room and helping with our wholesale side of things. He's, um, he's good at what he does and, uh, he, he's, he's selling more beer than I think we have. Um, <laughs> Year round, but it will be a regular repeating occurrence. It may not be every day of the year, but we hope to have transparency year round. We kind of settled on a recipe that is a, a classic West Coast feel to it. Um, it's primarily American pale, um, real barley. We use a little bit of, um, of like a biscuit malt to get a little bit of that malty character. And then um, just a touch of honey malt for a little bit of sweetness. Um, there's no caramel crystal malts. I know that kind of old school, traditional West Coast. Um, we didn't want it to be quite that heavy. Um, yeah. So we relied on that little bit of honey malt and uh, the biscuit malt to get us there. And then, like I said, dry hopped it with Centennial and Amarillo. And um, I think we used Cascade in the boil, if I'm 100% correct. Um, well, and I, I always find that that's the big, the big dividers, whether you use the, the caramel malts or not, because I feel like that, plus with the hopping, you end up with like the candied orange kind of thing. Yeah. And you don't, you know, you get like, like, this to me is like classic West Coast, like West Coast American IPA. It's got the citrus. It's got a pretty significant grapefruit note. And then like the pine kind of comes in kind yeah. of on the, the latter half. But you don't get that like super sweet kind of candied orange thing up front that you get in some American IPA. Yeah. Yeah. I'm definitely of the camp that I'm, I'm not a fan of the use of crystal malts in IPA. There are award winning IPAs that use them. <laughs> not gonna tell you my way is right and someone else's way is wrong um it's just my personal preference um so typically as you see our ipa is going to be a little bit drier and yeah not have quite as much candied orange is actually a great descriptor of that um so i tend to stray, uh, stray away from that um but yeah i mean the fun thing with the transparency series was trying a bunch of new things and just because we settled on a year round version doesn't mean we're not going to keep experimenting with West Coast IPAs. In fact, it's, it's kind of just the opposite. It means we will always have transparency in addition to runoff right. and with. So instead of, hey, we have transparency and it's different every time. Now we will always have transparency and something different rotating throughout the year. And was this a pre like a prior version of transparency that just became like your favorite or after all the iterations, you kind of put together the things that you like the most about transparency? Yeah, it, um, the latter, um, we kind of learned from all the different batches we made. Um, but it, there are some that it will taste very familiar. If, if, if you've kept up with our transparency series, which I know <laughs> ridiculous names, um, you know, we had governmental transparency, the future is transparency, you know, retro transparency, modern transparency, you know, it's all, you know, whatever. Yeah. But, um, this one is, is, is probably pretty similar to one we recently did, which was the future is transparency. Um, that one has a similar hot bill and the malts are, are pretty close. Um, mm -hmm. That's probably the one that's most similar to, um, but it is, it is it's a unique beer. Um, and yeah. we have kind of from all the different versions of transparency, you know, what, what do we like about this one? What do we not like about that one? And how do we make, you know, the best iteration of it? That's awesome. So uh, why don't you give us kind of the, the Cliff Notes background on, on Glass Jug and kind of how you guys got to this point and then tell us a little bit about this, uh, this beautiful new tap room that you're sitting in. Yeah, sure. I'll, uh, I'll try not to ramble too much because <laughs> the long and convoluted history at this point, um, which is funny because I feel like we just did open this yesterday, but I'll <laughs> to remember what happened, what we were doing before we owned the glass jug. So um, yeah, as I mentioned, we opened in 2014, September 2014 as a retail beer and wine shop in South Durham with, you know, the focus at the time was the, the growler law line had just changed to allow um, retail shops like the Glass Jug um, to fill growlers on demand. Before that point, you had to go to a brewery to do it. Um, so we sort of jumped on that. Um, we put in some counter pressure growler filling machines and really like hyped the, the growler fills to go. We had a bunch of beers on draft that you couldn't get in package because this predated mobile canning. So there was, you know, at the time there was fewer than a hundred breweries in North Carolina. Um, it was in our first year that we crossed the 100 mark. I think we're approaching 400 at this point. So years later so there was fewer than 100 breweries in north carolina we carried all of all of north carolina beer and package that was available we had all of it we didn't say that's impossible to imagine right now you need a much bigger bottle shop 
Yeah, well, it all fit on one shelf too. Yeah. Like out Mobile Candy, and it was only the the big guys, and there just weren't that many breweries. We thought there were. We're like, oh, hundred breweries, a whole lot, but there weren't that many. Um, and so we, we started doing that um, with kind of that that catch of all the stuff that you haven't ever been able to get in package. We have it on draft and send it home to growlers. Um, we did that for three years in that space, um, and as we grew, you know the the industry changed, our market changed. What we learned was, you know, growlers started to fade out, crowlers started to fade in, um, mobile canning became a thing. So there's the availability of packaged beer in general took off. Um, so growlers weren't really the thing to hang our hat on. We still fill growlers and we still take pride in doing that, um, but it's not like the thing anymore. Um, so at that point we realized the need was we were in South Durham RTP area where there, there really wasn't any other craft beer at the time. I mean, you could drive in the Oak Valley and hit Sam's Bottle Shop and Growler Girls had just opened up. Uh, Barrel Culture was getting ready to open, so that was exciting. But, you know, we were kind of the place without having to drive into downtown Durham or downtown Raleigh or Chapel Hill. And so we had become more of a hangout, but we only had like five tables inside. And um, people, you know, couldn't buy six packs off the shelf because there's too many people standing in the way drinking beer. So we realized we needed a bigger space. Um, so three years in, um, we moved within the same shopping center to a much bigger suite with a big outdoor beer garden. Um, and I said to Katie at the time, if we're gonna spend all this money and make this big move, you know, growlers are no longer the differentiating factor. Let, let's put a brewery in. You know, we had been brewing and home brewing since college. So it had been a decade at that point. Um, and I said, let's just, let's do it. All these guys that I, I grew up home brewing with, they're all running breweries. I can learn from them. We can do collaborations. I've got the connections to figure this out. I did not go to a brewing uh, like college program. Um, it was more you know, learning from the guys that we were home brewing with that, that you know, hit the big time, I guess. Um, and, and for everybody out there, the cliff notes of that is that Chris really wanted some big shiny new toys uh, to play with if he was gonna go through a construction project. That's, that's fair. Uh, also, I wanted to, you know, it, up to that point, the first three years, Katie was our only full-time employee. I, I had another full-time job. I was our uh, night and weekend volunteer stocking shelves and tending the bar on the, uh, the slow shifts. Um, but so at that point, it gave me the opportunity to leave my job and, and both of us go full-time at the jug. Katie managed the tap room. I was our entire production team at the time. Um, put in a little three barrel system, opened up the new space in 2018. Um, so yeah, I guess it was a little over three years. It was early 2018, mm -hmm. the new space, not even new anymore. I got a newer one, jeez. I, I will say though, I, I do actually remember the first time I saw an article talking about you guys opening up the new space and adding the beer garden. Uh, and like at the time we were living in our, like the, in RTP, like over on the TW Alexander. And I was like, man, I'm like, we're finally gonna get a place like right near here. Uh, Hallelujah. <laughs> right about the same time, girl culture popped in, which was great. Uh, but they were only open like three days a week at, at first. Yeah, they, yeah, they really eased into it. Us having the bottle shop and, and being open for three years, you know, we, we had a following at that point already, which was nice. Um, but yeah, so we opened 2018, added the, the new space. We kept the full bottle shop selection. Um, we put in our own, you know, three barrel brew house with four seven barrel fermenters with the idea that we were going to brew for our own tap room. And if we have a little extra to send out to a few accounts, cool, draft only. Um, and then I decided, well, that wasn't good enough. Um, <laughs> we started, I'm, I'm sensing a trend here. Yeah, well, we started mobile canning and we were double batching everything and people wanted our beer and I didn't know. And um, so it got to the point where we on a little three barrel system were producing, we're, even with producing some lagers, we were still hitting close to 300 barrels a year, which is minuscule amounts of beer, but on a three barrel system, it's a lot of brew days. I said, that seems like a pretty much max capacity at that point for what you had. Yeah, especially for one guy, me. Yeah, yeah, the, the one man band. <laughs> so I hired an assistant brewer. Um, we were double batching. We started mobile canning about once a quarter. Um, and then we, at that point, about two years into the new, I keep calling it the new space. I can't, I got to stop doing that. It's three years. <laughs> new one anymore. Um, but a couple years into that space, we, um, 
we're thinking about what is what is our next growth move? Do we open an, um, another bottle shop? At that point, bottle shops had been opening everywhere. Um, you know, and we were in, in that point not even any longer the only bottle shop with an on-site brewery in North Carolina. Um, we were when we opened. Um, Salud had their own brand for their bottle shop, but they weren't brewing on site. So I, I want to give credit where it's due. They were the first bottle shop to have their own brewery brand. We were the first ones to have a brewery on site. Um, now there's several like that. Like we, we keep finding the new thing and then uh, people I find you, first mover advantage though. What was that? First mover advantage. You guys find the trend. Everybody follows along. You guys find the next trend. Yeah. So we decided what, what made the most sense for us instead of trying to do the whole bottle shop thing again is we were starting to build a following for our for our beers. And um, we had won some medals. People were asking to carry it in other shops. And we felt like at the bottle shop, like our our space, it was hard to really focus so much on our beer because we had such a reputation of being a great bottle shop and bringing in all sorts of other beer. And we didn't want to let that go. So we decided what we wanted to do was open a, a tap room that was primarily focused on our brand and our beers um, because the bottle shop had grown to be this thing that was a beer garden and a bottle shop and a brewery and a brewery tap room, like all in one. And it was just, it was, it's great. I love it. And, and we, people keep coming out and drinking beer with us. So it's yep. great. Um, but it's doing a lot of things. It's one space trying to, to scratch a lot of itches, which is great. It's a one-stop shop for beer, wine, get it all, have it here, take it to go. But we didn't have that, you know, immersive brand experience for our beer. Um, so that was really what got us wanting to open a new tap room. And, you know, when we said, where do we want to do it? There was not much hesitation um, in saying we want to be in Durham. Like we were already, we had been living in Durham um, since shortly after graduation college um, in Chapel Hill. So it's not like we were that far away. Uh, <laughs> Durham for a while, and Katie and I grew up on the other side of Raleigh. So we were familiar with Durham and we love Durham. It is our city and Durham doesn't have a ton of breweries. Um, it's not Wake County. It's not Mecklenburg County. Like Durham County, yes, it is not as populated as those counties, but on a per capita basis, the, breweries, the brewery scene is, is behind. And I don't mean in quality, I mean in, in number. Mm -hmm. uh, so to opening, like stay her claim, you know, Durham is, is a huge landmass city. Um, you know, it, it sprawls. So our original tap room, you know, it's a 20 minute drive to get from there to here in our new space, but we never leave Durham city limits to do that. Um, and so we said, we just, there's so many people who live in our city that don't even know our, our name. Um, so we said, well, we want to be downtown. We want to be where the action is. Um, we found this great spot that is on Foster Street, right across the street from the new Durham food hall. Um, it's a couple blocks from Full Steam and Dirty Bull. You know, you got Dame's Chicken and Waffles over here, the um, Boxcar Arcade, Barcade, the um, Urban Axes, Axe Throwing, and then like right out our window is Durham Central Park with the Farmer's Market. So, yeah, I mean, you couldn't have found more, a more central location in downtown Durham to, uh, to go make the leap for something like this. Yeah, and well, yes and no. I think it, it's central in terms of what is becoming like the entertainment district of Durham. Right. Not the like city center of, of Durham. Like we're, we're closer to the old ballpark than the current DBAP. Right. And really walking distance from the DPAC. Um, you know, we're not like on Main Street. Um, you know, and I, I think there's pros and cons to that. But I do think that this neck of the woods, it's a little edgier. It's up and coming. It's where there, there's breweries. It's the old warehouse, you know. Um, it's, a, you know, the Liberty Warehouse is across the street. So it's... Mm -hmm. It's part of town we wanted to be in. We said, if we're going to be downtown, this is, it feels right. Um, and, and having conversations with Sean over at Full Steam, Matt at Dirty Bull, like both great friends of ours and, and wanting to, to build something in this area, just, it, it felt right. I think it was the, hopefully the right, we'll see. We hadn't sold a single beer here yet. So I'm hopefully it's the, the right place, the right time, um, and it'll all work out. I mean, I think that's super cool also, like, to have it all, like, where people can come and for a night out. I mean, literally, they don't have to walk more than three or four blocks in any one direction. And there's three breweries. There's, I don't even know how many restaurants at this point now in that area. Um, and, you know, Main Street's not that bad of a walk. I mean, I've, I've definitely yeah. walked that back and forth. And I wouldn't be surprised if you guys are, you know, the longer you guys are there, that those two parts of downtown are going to kind of converge. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. As much as I say Durham as a, as a city is a huge sprawling city. Uh, but yeah, downtown is, is fairly walkable.
Yeah. So you decided to open a tap room and have been building a tap room during a global pandemic with, <laughs> where yeah. people can't really drink on site very much. So tell me a little bit about that. Well, our plan was to open a tap room by the summer of 2020. And uh, yeah, no, it's not 2020. <laughs> that kind of, we, we pumped the brakes on that pretty hard. Um, you know, we were, we had picked out this spot before the pandemic hit. Uh, we were already um, negotiating a lease. We were trying to, like, it was 2019 when we were pushing to like, hey, let's get open by summer. Oh, wow. uh, so we were knee deep in lease negotiations when the pandemic hit. And um, we kind of, you know, we put that on pause. The landlord also wanted to kind of put it on pause. You know, ev everything just took a break. Right. Uh, it actually enabled us to rethink the lease negotiations and, and figure out a way that we could open during a pandemic and protect ourselves if there was another shutdown. Um, so we have, you know, a great landlord here. Um, the, the, the developers that built the building and still own it, um, they worked with us and were willing to basically tie our rent to our um, uh, capacity restrictions to a certain point. There's still a floor. We have to pay some rent, even, right. even if we have to pay rent. Um, there's no, no free lunch, I guess. But, uh, <laughs> but they were able to give us uh, that assurance that, hey, if we're at 25% capacity, we're not going to be paying 100% of our rent. Right. Because um, most, almost, I would say 99% of people in this business don't have that in their lease because who would have thought? Um, but so we were able to put that in there. We also were able to work out a pretty lengthy uh, build out timeline, knowing that city permitting was behind. Construction in Durham is going bonkers right now. Um, yeah. <laughs> knowing that it was gonna take a while, given the pandemic, you know, getting permits and getting anyone in, in city government to, to do stuff is tough. Not to complain if anyone in city government is watching, you guys have been great. Um, shout out to our uh, police officer, Andrew Wilkinson has been phenomenal. Anna over at the ABC has been great. Uh, our fire inspector, uh, Michael, whose last name I'm forgetting, he has been awesome. But there are plenty of, of bureaucratic red tape that we've had to jump through and we knew we would, so we were able to get a longer um, term for build out. Um, so actually our, our first rent check is due tomorrow. So uh, we are uh, proceeding by here. So, uh, so why don't you give us a little bit of a, of a tour of this, uh, this brand new tap room that we're uh we're getting ready to come down and uh and start uh, drinking it yeah all right let me uh figure this out i'm gonna flip the camera around here so. all right all right we're gonna go oh no i'll stick this way let me get make everyone seasick here uh, <laughs> back to the front door we'll come in as if we're we're doing the the, the real shebang so i don't know yeah, if you can see all across the street there um but yeah so when we come in um this is what we've got here um <clears throat> We've got some very nice merch. I think I saw Ryan, our graphic designer, just joined. Hopefully he's still here. Show off some of his hairs. Uh, but we've got merch coming in. We've got a to-go cooler that'll um, primarily be our beer um, in cans as well as crowlers, and then um, all of our non-alcoholic selections. We'll have some local kombuchas, some sodas, those sorts of things. We'll all be here, you know, the non-alcoholic stuff for here to go, and then mm -hmm. grab cans and crowlers of our beer. And then, um, actually, I'm going to spin this over this way. Um, you know, we're doing this at night, so you're just looking at my reflection now. But Durham Central Park is right through that window. Um, yeah. <laughs> but we got some great furniture actually just delivered today from um, Bull City uh, Designs. They did some great custom furniture. These oh, are like local. Yeah. Yeah, local furniture, local mural, um, local contractors. Um, we did as much local as we could. The only things that were not local were the... Uh, fire alarm and sprinkler, which is why we're still not open because they're giant mega corporations that we were forced to use because they did the rest of the building. But um, that's all the complaining I'm going to do about that. Um, everything else that we could do local, we did. Um, and so we, we worked with uh, Atlantic Corporate Con Contracting, whose office is actually in the Durham Bulls Stadium. Hey, look, we have people um, peering in our window. Uh, let's, 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 they're, they're thirsty. Um, <laughs> and uh, so... Uh, Atlanta Corporate Contracting was our contractors. Uh, they're based out of the Durham Bulls Stadium. Um, they're great about bringing in some local folks. Our plumbers are literally on the same street as us. Um, so yeah, we tried to go as local as we could. Um, for the bar, uh, I'll give you a quick look here. We actually worked with Spoonflower, another local company, to do some sweet wallpaper. That uh, be that's a beautiful bar you got there. Beer, beer Labby uh, wallpaper going on. Oh, look at that. Uh, a nice mirror backsplash. 
And um, yeah, and then we uh, yeah, put the bar out here with some nice uh, color coming through, lights on it. Um, yeah. And then we we're gonna do a poured concrete countertop. We decided to go quartz, which I think was the right call. It's harder, it's smoother, it'll last longer, and it still kind of looks like concrete. I'd say a lot, uh, a lot less maintenance for that. Yeah, and then um, we got some sweet new tap handles um, that Ryan also designed. Um, and then Crafty Beer Guys installed our draft system, which is looking great. And I will say from the test pours we've done, it pours beer like a charm. Um, we've also got, you'll see on the far right and far left, we have two of the um, side wow. pools. So we will have um, one of our other year round beers that we'll eventually have out here is Bunsen, um, which is our Vienna lager. Um, mm -hmm. We'll have it on the side pool all year round, which just pours a beautiful, beautiful lager. Um, if you have not had a lager on a side pool, I strongly encourage it. Come try it out. We will have one to start, and we'll have rotating lagers on the other one. Um, awesome. And, and then, so how many how many taps total are we are we running in this place? So the tap tower here is sixteen. You'll see left to right, we've got uh, the side pool for a lager. We then have water, um, so we don't want people to. Uh, be dehydrated we got water we'll have two guest uh ciders on tap and okay. then what does that leave 16 15, 13 13 of our beers uh, mm -hmm. at right now we've got about 10 with three empties that we will fill shortly um but that, uh, that's the look there and then uh in this nice little empty spot with just boxes in the corner we are putting in a um a wine draft system as well um mm -hmm. so reds and two white wines on draft all the time which you know, yeah, we're a brewery and I feel like a lot of breweries are bad about like, oh yeah, we have a red and a white and they're crap. Um, we, we've always served great wine at our other location. And so, um, you know, why not keep doing that here? Um, so we'll have some great wines on draft and then I'll, I'll spin us around and just give a, well, I guess I got to back up here to get our whole mural in here that uh, we just had done by uh, uh, special signs, SPSL signs on Instagram. Um, he's done some great work um, for us. He's done some work at the Durham Food Hall. He just did a bunch of stuff for uh, Jay Light's Market and Cafe. Um, mm -hmm. And then he did the bathrooms at um, the barbershop over on 9th Street. The, uh, I forget, the Aer Aero Barbershop? Uh, guaranteed shorter hair. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but he does great work. He came and did the, the mural for us, Drink Durham, with some hops and barley on it. Um, so shout out to him for that. And then... Uh, Finish your tour here, uh, back hallway. We don't need to walk down, but if you're uh, looking for the restrooms, they're back there. there uh, but here, we'll, we'll take a quick look on the patio while, uh, and then I'll, I'll spin it around and stop making everybody seasick. <laughs> uh, so we've got a, uh, a little built-in booth in the corner and we'll have some tables out here. And then this uh, rail, actually tomorrow, we're getting put in a little drink rail there so you can stand. Um, well, not during COVID, you'll have to sit. We'll put bar stools here. Um, but you can stand or sit here and look out right into uh, Durham Central Park. So, and a nice little uh, skyline view of, of Durham. Um, that is such a great view for, uh, for drinking a couple of beers on a nice day. Oh yeah, no, it's great. And it's, uh, it's fun because, you know, everything and I'm gonna flip this back around here, you know, look at me now. Um, <laughs> you know, everything that goes on in Durham Central Park, it's, it's like the best people watching in town. Um, you know, we've just been out here doing all the construction and stuff and just watching, you know, dance troops and, uh, you know, musical performances and, you know, all sorts of stuff going on out there. It's, it's fun to sit out there and, here and just soak in everything that is Durham. Oh, yeah. And I, I will say, so like, I feel like I've walked past that space like a number of times over the last year. And I didn't realize how big of a space that, that kind of, that corner, uh, that corner spot was um you've got a lot of indoor space in there yeah it's not huge and, you know we don't have it all packed out because we you know i know the governor just announced we can have 75 capacity but we had only ordered 50 percent um tables and they're custom built tables and chairs so we're going to be a few weeks behind. oh boy i thought i thought he did that change just for you guys for your opening yeah well we didn't want to this is custom built furniture it ain't cheap um yeah <laughs> use and then um we actually today, Katie ordered some more, so we'll be able to pack it out in here. But right now, I think we've got seating for uh, indoor and outdoor about, about 50, uh, which is pretty good. You know, our, our current space in RTP, we only, with 50% capacity, we only have five tables inside. So it's like 20 people inside. But then we have the big outdoor beer garden. 
Um, here, you know, we have a nice patio and we can put 20 or 30 people out there because um, the patio on one side, and I didn't walk, but we do have some, some space in front uh, on the mm -hmm. fossil side that's not covered. Uh, but we're going to put a few little um, patio tables out there too. So we've got some outdoor space. It's not the big beer garden we're used to, um, but we do have Durham Central Park. And once they're, um, once they're back to doing events, um, it'll be great. Um, when they're doing special events and the ability for breweries to sell beer in the park and buy beer here and walk out into the park, that'll be awesome. Now you can't so, do that. so people will be allowed to buy beer from the tap room and walk out in the Central Park? Let me let me clarify. I say uh, I want I want to make sure we're very clear here, so people don't don't uh, violate uh, open container laws. Uh, um, on any average day, no, you cannot do that. You will need to stay on our patio. Um, but when there are special events, as a brewery, we have a special events permit, and um, the Durham Central Park when they um, food truck rodeos, farmers market, concerts, um, because they're doing a special event, and we have a special events permit, we can serve and allow people to drink out there. Um, it, there's permitted stuff that goes on behind the scenes on our end um, to make sure it's all kosher. But as far as a, uh, 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 any of our guests need to know is on days where there's special events, we will hand you a plastic cup and say, go at it, have fun in the park. We hand you a glass, don't take it in the park. <laughs> <laughs> so, what, so what you're telling me is basically going forward, you guys are the beer garden and the exclusive, uh, or the set beer, beer provider for all these special events because you're going to be there 100% of the time. Oh yeah, yeah. If you're trying to book a wedding at Durham Central Park, uh, we got the beer covered. Uh, you're good. Um, we also apparently just love farmers markets. Uh, our, our, you know, our RTP location, our parking lot is the top Durham farmers market. Yep. And now, literally, I, I didn't even put this out. The steps off of our window are technically in the park. We had to have an easement for those steps to be put in because they're on park the park property. Like we are literally, you can stand on our patio and, and reach out, and you're in the park. Uh, <laughs> And, and the farmer's market is right there. So yeah, apparently we, we love farmer's market, which we do, it's great. I about to say, they're great. So now that you've shown us the tour, tell us a little bit about the beer that you brewed to commemorate the opening. Yeah, what, oh, I'm using, the, I'm using it to hold up my phone, hold on. <laughs> switch it out. Uh, I'll switch it out, there we go. Yeah, so we did um, <clears throat> Foster Street IPA. It's uh, just kind of one-off, fun, hazy IPA. It is distinctly different than our Opacity um, series. Um, it's a Golden Promise malt base, which I, I love to work with. It gives it more of a, excuse me, more of an orange kind of hue than our Opacity is like bright yellow. It almost like glows. This one's, yeah, I don't want to say muddier, but it's a little more orange, it's, a little deeper. Yeah, it's deeper. And, and this light is giving it a terrible thing because it's kind of making it, it's making it look out. There you go. That's better. That's a better look yeah. at it. What it actually looks like. <laughs> uh, it doesn't photograph well, but hazy IPAs just never photograph well. It's really tough because the the color the color gets off pretty much no matter what you do. Yeah, yeah, hazy IPAs just soak up all the light. Um, no, so this is a, a one-off hazy we did. It has a, a rendering of our tap room on the front. Um, it is um, we used amarillo and citra and. Yeah, that was we double dry hopped it with Amarillo. Mm -hmm. It's actually funnily uh, the two beers are trying both Amarillo, uh, but this one with a more uh, citric character, the other one more Centennial. Obviously, it's it's your your classic hazy IPA, low bitterness, big mouthfeel, wheat, oats, um, high protein content. Um, so super smooth, low bitter, um, big juicy hop aroma on the nose. Mm -hmm. Amarillo is fun because you get like a really orange, like fresh, like orange zest, almost like a little bit of like orange, like actual orange, not like orange zest too, which I- No, I, 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 that, like that, I think that's a perfect way to describe it. Like you get like the, almost like the art, like the fresh orange juice, but you get the orange zest too. And it's, it's like the dominant note that I get. Yeah, if only you got these at halftime of your soccer games, right? <laughs> <laughs> I feel like the second half would get a little sloppy, but. <laughs> well, that's the whole thing. This one is only six and a half percent. So it's on the, the, the fashionable end for hazy IPAs, I would say. Um, the other cool thing about this beer is it was the first beer we brewed at um, the Rocky Mountain Mills. Um, I haven't even actually talked about. But I was about to say, I was like, we're going to have to talk. You know, now you're going to have a lot of demand for this beer because you're going to be serving all these special events at Durham Central Park. You've got all these taps to fill. So you yeah, can't the, do that on a, on a three-barrel brew house and four seven-barrel fermenters. Yeah, no, this, this one will have to make a comeback, I'm sure. But uh, um, yeah, so we knew opening a second tap room 
you know, we had designed the, for the our original brewery to brew enough beer for one tap room. So opening another in a densely populated, highly trafficked area, we knew that we were not going to be able to sustain that. So we looked at many different options. You know, option one would be, well, let's build out a bigger brewery. Um, to be able to afford to do that while also opening Tap room is just not an option for us. We're not comfortable taking on that amount of debt. I don't even know if a bank would loan us that amount of money. That's a lot of money. Katie and I are not independently wealthy people. Uh, we have borrowed all the money we can uh, and are still trying to pay it back um, from all the previous build outs. So that was out of the question. Um, <clears throat> the other option would have been to, to have another bigger brewery contract brew for us. And there are breweries that have space, have open fermenters that are willing to contract brew. Um, for us, we would need that on such a regular, consistent basis, and we would be in such a bind if their um, demand picked up and we no longer can contract that that was not really an enticing option for us. Um, so the, the last option is called an alternating proprietorship, which is what the structure is at the Rocky Mountain Mills, which is perfect for us because we sign it kind of lease at the mills um, to basically be one of the alternating proprietors of the brewery there. So there is a brew house on site and we take turns. Um, so we have an alternating proprietorship with brewery that is shared between us and barrel culture because we, we felt like we weren't close enough when we were a mile <laughs> share a brew house. Um, so us, barrel culture, Crystal Coast and Spaceway all share the same brew house. We all have our own fermentation tanks. It is all our own staff brewing our own beers. We're not having anyone else brew it, but we have a lease and it's a three year term. We have the option to renew, like it's, it's structured, stable, and we pay, you know, basically rent and a barrelage fee to use the facility, to use the, the shared, you know, glycol and CO2 and oxygen and water and electric and all the, all the things you need. Yeah. And then there's a shared canning line that not only do all of us use but also the um the breweries that are stationed there not part of the alternative proprietorship so hot fly is probably the one people will most recognize we use the same canning line as them as well as mythic brewing um so they were the old uh what is that ddb or what, what they yeah, yeah they just did in the last six months or so i believe um but yeah them and hot fly also share a canning line with us so there's six of us on the same canning line. so scheduling gets hectic that canning line gets a workout uh, but it's great because there's so many people using it um, that people know how to operate that line. And it, you know, at this point, now that it's being used, I mean, to, not quite to its max, but pretty close, um, it's running pretty well. Um, it's a little ABS five head uh, filler. Mm -hmm. and it's, it's, can, we've had, we've done two canning runs there. Actually, both the beers we tried today um, were our first two beers from Rocky Mount. So all right, that all that to say the Foster Street was kind of our, Hey, we're going to do a one-off because it's a brand new system that we haven't brewed on and we don't want to brew one of our flagships. Let's do something fun, exciting, brand it for the new tap room, try to release it about the time the tap room opens. Um, and so that's what we did. It was a fun one-off, super successful. Uh, it, the beer turned out great. We were all thrilled with it. One of our highest rated beers on untapped for people who are into that. Ooh. For, hey, for a six point, for a 6.5% ABV uh, beer on untapped, I, I, to be one of our top rated, I'm, I'm cool with that. Uh, it, still, it still blows my mind that, that ABV factors into uh, to how people rate the IBS, but I, I don't want to go down that road. Um, so so you mentioned that you grew this as a one-off because you're, it was your first time brewing on a new brew house. So for the things that you guys are going to be brewing more regularly, I mean, how do you how do you now adjust to brewing in a new brew house with different size, you know, different size fermenters, you know, a whole different setup versus what you've been used to for the last couple of years. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, the fermenter size is the least of our worries. The water is different and the water is the main ingredient. Yep. Um, there's, you know, the mill crushes differently. There's an auger system. We don't have an auger. The, the mash tun has rakes. We don't have rakes. Like, it's, just, it's different equipment. Um, the geometry of the mash tun is still pretty similar, like, scale-wise. Um, but, yeah, it is bigger. We're going from three barrels at a time to ten, so we're over tripling the size. Um, so yeah, we had to make adjustments. We're making adjustments to the water to try and match what we're doing mm -hmm. in South Durham. Um, we're making adjustments to hop utilization. Um, the efficiency is slightly different. We get a better efficiency on that system because of the rakes. Right. Um, mash to get just a little bit beer nerdy. Our mash ton um, in South Durham doesn't have rakes, meaning 
we, mat, we mix the water and the grain together and it sits. Um, I have a paddle and I mix it up at the beginning. I've, I've seen that wooden pa pa paddle like propped up on the, on the, pl the platform there uh, from time to time. Yeah, it's a, it's a beast of a paddle. Um, it's like way over past what we need, but um, a good buddy of our mate, ours made it for us as a gift back in the day. But uh, so yeah, I, I'll stir it up at the beginning, but the nice thing in Rocky Mountain is there's mechanical rakes that during the whole mash, it is slowly keeping that mixed. And so the result is we get a higher efficiency. And when I say efficiency, I mean, we extract more sugar grain than we do in South Durham. Um, it's just more efficient at extracting that sugar. So that's what I mean by efficiency for mm -hmm. not, 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 not who don't do this every day. So yes, the, the, all that to say, yes, we have to account for things that are different. Um, I will challenge anybody um, right now. And honestly, I've not done this myself, but I'm gonna do it tomorrow. Um, transparency that's available right now in cans was brewed in Rocky Mount. The transparency that's available on draft was brewed in Durham. Um, Try them side by side, get a crowler and a can, take them home, pour them side by side. Let me know what you think. Tell me if you can see the difference. Now I'm interested. Yeah, that's a, that's a good test. Yeah. I, um, you know, I was trying to while we were canning today and then having a pint with you, honestly, I had you know, a few sips of a short fill at canning and then this one now are the first two finished and packaged. And I would say after having on draft a few days ago, it's to my taste, they seem pretty spot on, but I, I have not tried them side by side, but. I will also, be re realistically how many people are going to go to the uh, the RTP tap room, try it, and then like run over to the new downtown tap room when it's open, you know, very shortly, and uh, and test it out or or, or open the uh, the can version and uh, and try it. Yeah, yeah right now, everywhere draft, no matter which tap room, uh, draft was from Durham and cans were from. So you don't have to go between the tap rooms; you can get them all at one if you want. <laughs> But yeah, so that, it's, it is a challenge. And that's why you know, doing that first batch was a learning opportunity to kind of see what is the efficiency gonna be? What is gonna be different about this? How is our hop utilization gonna work out? How, what's the water profile? We did all the water testing, we did all that to try and figure it out, test it one time. And then yeah, batch number two was transparency, which we had just brewed the first time year round batch in um, RTP. And then turned it a few weeks later to brew it on a 10 barrel scale in Rocky Mountain. Um, so it's the first real test. How, how good of a job did we do at, at matching? So I'll, uh, I, I won't brag about it, I'll let you guys be the judge and, and tell me if, if we did it right or not. Well, and so, and so now that you guys are gonna have the, the space of the alternating proprietorship, I mean, how, how much are you guys gonna be able to brew now all in? Yeah, um, a lot, but also not a lot. Um, <laughs> again, I was having this conversation with Jason today. I'm like, so in Rocky Mount, we have two 10 barrel tanks and two 20 barrel tanks. So it'll take our annual production from sub 300 barrels a year to close to a thousand barrels, you know, moving from a three barrel to a 10 barrel. Similar. I mean, that's, that's substantial. It is. And actually, um, funny thing I actually learned um, from Rich at the Brewers Guild during your Pints of Love Fest, which is one of my new favorite stats. Um, so shout out to Rich is, and I, I would fact check this, but I know Rich knows what he's talking about. <clears throat> because he looks at this stuff all the time. It's his job, literally it's his job. Yep. Uh, is that of all the breweries in North Carolina, which they're near 400 now, 75% um, of them brew less than 1,000 barrels a year. So that means once we're at full capacity, we will be on that cusp of being in the top 25% largest breweries in North Carolina, which to me is, is ridiculous. <laughs> like, we're selling 90% of, eh, 80 to 90% of what we brew in our tap rooms. Like, there's only a handful accounts that carry our beer because we just don't have enough like jason came to me today like hey uh craft uh public house they, they just sold out of two half barrels of opacity they want some more I'm like no i need it for the tap room yeah <laughs> uh, you know like we're, we're not that big but uh but yeah it'll get us up to close to a thousand barrels a year the nice thing is the two 20 barrel tanks is what allows us to now have year-round beers so one of those 20 barrel tanks is literally going to alternate opacity transparency opacity transparency all year round um, so every six to eight weeks, we'll have a new batch of opacity, and then in between, we'll have a batch of transparency. So three to four weeks, we'll have one or the other. And then the other 20-barrel tank will be Bunsen year-round, because uh, it's okay. a lot uh, six to seven week until we package it. Um, so six or seven week turnaround, every six or seven weeks, we'll have another batch of Bunsen. So that's our two 20-barrel tanks are only going to make three beers, but they're going to be around year-round. And so now I'm stuck with only two 10 barrels. I'm like, man, I already have four sevens. Two tens really isn't that much more. 
But what it allows us to do is say, okay, well, I'm going to use one of those tins to do all of our one-off hazy IPAs because we'll have opacity. Now we can do one-off hazies, not just opacity. Yeah. And then we have transparency, and now we can do one-off West Coast IPAs. And if I brew all my IPAs there and all my year rounds there, now I have four seven barrel tanks in South Durham. And I can do whatever the heck I want with. I'll say now, now you can really get weird. Oh yeah, and we will. We'll, I mean, we'll get weird and we'll get traditional. You know, like. I, well, I would say just just keep brewing the Schwartz beer, and we're we're okay. Oh yeah, I mean we. So you know, we have Bunsen year round, and then I'll have one tank in. Durham that basically is the feeder tank to build up my yeast, so it'll be my rotating loggers. How are you guys still, still uh, hear me? I just got you. Yeah, you dropped out for a second, and we got we got you back. Okay, um, but yeah, we'll keep rotating loggers going around. So we'll have some traditional loggers. We'll be able to do our dry stout. We'll be able to do a wee heavy. We've got. I mean, I've got an English pub ale in the tank right now. Um, I, next I saw when you posted that and I was I was very excited for that moment because I feel like recently in North Carolina the only brewery that I feel like has come out with an, like any kind of like English traditional English pub ale on a regular basis is Dissolver um, who's done a couple of one off ones but nobody really local I think in a while yeah yeah so we've got that in the tank you know we got a Dunkel on draft now I've got a uh, Mexican lager coming up you know so it's, it's we'll do some traditional stuff as well and, and get to do some more Belgian beer any Belgian beers in a while. I'm excited to Saison put out our, we did a great triple, uh, Newton's Third Law. Uh, mm -hmm. Thought of that because every action has an equal opposite reaction. So if you drink this, you get drunk. Um, that's the equal opposite reaction. Uh, it's like a 10% uh, triple that sneaks up on you. Um, well, we get to brew that again. You know, I have brewed triples and doubles and quads. And, you know, we'll, you know, we'll keep our annual sour beers going. We'll, you know, we'll be able to do some fun stuff and some weird stuff. And, you know, I have the freedom to do that because we have the big tanks to do the stuff that everyone comes out. You know, I get have fun doing these one off little things. They don't sell that well, but I have fun. It's, it lets me kind of flex my brewing muscles and see what we can do and how we can tweak things. Um, and but, you, never, you never know when one's going to, you know, one strikes a nerve and, and, and hits well, but, uh, um, so actually, the, the one thing I, I was curious about, just because I know you guys were trying to figure out what lager was going to be the year-round lager. So how did you guys settle on Bunsen? How did, you know, Vienna lager is not necessarily, I mean, obviously you've got, you know, Sam Adams, like Boston lager, whatever else, but like, there are not that many craft breweries that like a Vienna lager is one of their year-round kind of flagship offerings. Yeah, but they're great beers. <laughs> they, oh, they are, 100%. And you've got to get a Sam Adams or, you know, shout out to Red Oak, also North Carolina Brewery, um, makes a good amber lager. Um, <clears throat> but, yeah, no one's doing it. There's a hole in the market. Everyone, it's like, oh, we're going to do a year-round lager. Let's make a Pilsner. I can make a damn good Pilsner, but I don't want it to be our year-round. We'll keep making great Pilsners. I love Pilsners. But <clears throat> it gives us the opportunity to have that, like, something a little bit different and fun. Like, yeah, our two other ones are a West Coast IPA and a Hazy IPA. Yeah, everyone's doing it. So, you know, shoot, let's do a Vienna lager, you know? Why not? It's something that we tap at a, it's a decent price point for wholesale. It's a decent price point on draft. We can put it on the side pool. It's a fun conversation thing. And it's just a, you can sit down and have three, four, five of them and have fun with it. So, it, and it's, it's a delicious beer. We like making it and it tastes good. So, what, what? For it, the last time you brewed it, I had a crowler of it at the fire pit uh, in the fall. And uh, that was uh, an excellent beer for an excellent setting. But uh, I will say, if you guys keep brewing Cosmic Puzzle, I will drink it every time you brew it. But that's probably not nearly as feasible in terms of price point, just given what you're hopping it with. Yeah. Yeah, I will do some dry hot pilsners. I've got another one. Yeah, we've done, that's, that was our second dry hot pills. Um, we did an Italian pills, which was really fun. Um, so we'll keep doing that stuff, man. We'll keep rotating through fun pilsners and lagers. But yeah, Bunsen to me, it's just, it's a beer drinker's beer, man. It's people who don't want the hop. They don't want bitterness. Like, I just want a beer that tastes like beer. I mean, Bunsen is it. It is, is low alcohol, drink it all day. It's not offensive, but it's, it's quality. You know, it's a good ingredient, well-made, and it's easy drinking. And, it, it, and honestly, it's a good, like, have it with, with pizza, have it with food. It's a great food pairing beer. Well, and it, and it falls in that range where it's, it's not darker, it's not too dark or too light where it doesn't fit with a certain season for a lot of people. Like, that's an, a year-round crushable lighter beer yeah. for a lot of people. Yeah, you know, a lot of people think of their amber lagers as being your Mexican lager, which 
got Aztec coming out for Cinco de Mayo. Um, that will still be a thing. And then your Marzins in the fall, your Oktoberfest styles. Um, but a Vienna lager you know, falls in that same spectrum is very similar to a Mexican lager, if we're being honest. Yeah. Um, and, and also similar to a Marzin. It falls in that same spectrum, gives you those same flavors, but in a beer that's not tied to a season. It's not a spring beer, it's not a fall beer. It's just a beer beer, you know, have it whenever. Um, so I think we'll see a lot of it, you know, hey, talk to me in a year if we're not selling it and we've made our uh, Pilsner year round, you can uh, tell me I was wrong and I'm willing to admit it. I, I, <laughs> say never. I've seen too many brewers say, I'll never put my beer in cans or I'm never uh, making a smoothie sour, you know, and here they are doing it. So I'm not going to say never. Um, I could be wrong, but that's what we're, we're betting on right now. I mean, it's all a learning thing. I will say, I, I, actually, at the Pints of Love Festival, I, I definitely called uh, Eric at Full Steam out on that because I, I went back and found an interview from 2013 where he uh, he basically bashed like small craft breweries canning beer, and uh, yeah, that that one that that take didn't age very well. It probably it, it made sense at the time given the technology. Uh, yeah, Eric, Eric's a good friend of mine, and I, I hope he watches this because I, I'm gonna I, I'm just gonna say he. He's opinionated, you know, and I've I've been friends with Eric since he opened Mystery, you know, 2010, 11, um, but and before, but I think Shieldsy was on here at one point. Um, I don't know if Shieldsy's still on here, but I Shieldsy. <clears throat> but anyways, he, yeah, he, he's opinionated. And he said he at the time, which was a very accurate thing, like he's putting beer into John's Bombers. I'm never going to can my beer. Well, now I'm never going to put my beer into dang Bombers. Like, the industry changes, things change. He also said he wanted to open a restaurant, and he opened a pub, and it was great. Um, you know, like, you got to be willing to change. you got to be willing to, f to be flexible, I think. Um, I I've learned to, to watch what I say and not say never, um, because I may feel strongly about something, but the industry may change. People's opinions may change, and I think we're willing to change. Well, and I, and I, I will give this there. I, I will, in his case, the technology changed dramatically. I feel like 2013, there, there was not mobile – not mobile canning and small canning technology. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, we also, he said it anyways. I told him, I'm like, you're going to be eating those words. He's like, yeah, probably, but I'm still insane. <laughs> so yeah, technology changes, palettes change, you know, consumer preference is so. Absolutely. We're so uh, I think we got one more thing we definitely need to cover because it, it's probably going to be the only non beer related thing. Um, yeah. But you guys have something else coming out for the summer that's non-beer related. Tell us a little bit about uh, about the seltzer rotation. <laughs> yeah, here I'm actually gonna walk behind the bar and plug in my phone because I don't I, I don't want you to lose me mid seltzer because oh there, there we go we we don't lose the seltzer. Um, yeah, so you know what I was saying with the um, being able to open up some freedom at our uh, Durham brewery is gonna allow us to do some more fun stuff. And one of those things that we're gonna be doing is this summer. We're going to put out a new seltzer each month, um, different flavor each month that'll just be available at our tap rooms. Um, we're brewing our first one, um, oh, let's see, in just a couple weeks. Um, it'll probably be ready late April, early May. Um, we're going to do mango, which was our, we did a pilot batch last year of, of mango seltzer, um, which we named after our longtime bartender, uh, Brian Rogers. Uh, we just called the seltzer Brian Rogers. Uh, we, I don't know that we'll keep that He's name. famous now. <laughs> yeah, for all the right reasons. <laughs> um, no, we love Brian, but um, I'm not, we haven't actually, I just now realized we have no name for our seltzer line, but we will come up with something. Um, but yeah, we figure opening the tap room right here next to Central Park and having the big beer garden and just seeing the trend in seltzers, like, no, we're not going to have mixed 12 packs of flavors in the grocery store. We're not trying to compete with White Claw and, um, or even Cersei or Mother Earth, but you know we want to have something fun to put on tap during the summer. Um, you know we played with the idea of doing beer slushies, which again I'm not going to say never, um, but we felt like seltzers would be a fun kind of tangent thing to do that complements what we're doing. It's still you know we're making it in a in a beer setting. Um, it is still a, a fermented product and um, it's fun. It's it's fun. It's exciting. It's you know we don't take things too seriously. I think the headline tomorrow morning is uh, Chris Creech plans to take down White Claw. And uh... Uh, yeah, uh, well, yeah, I won't. <laughs> I probably shouldn't say this until I get 
going to cease and desist. Um, but we aren't making it anymore, so it's fine, I guess. You know, when we did the pilot batch, uh, we released a single sixtal of the – we the way we brewed it, to get, again, a little scientific here, we brewed a, a high ABV seltzer base and then blended it with reverse osmosis water to get down to a like, 5% seltzer. Mm -hmm. Base was about 14%. Um, so before we blended it, we pulled off a sixtal of 14% seltzer, added our mango, and, uh, and called it Clawless. Uh, <laughs> because we had done a collab with Dirty Bull, um, who we're going to actually, now that we've talked about Eric at Full Steam and uh, Matt at Dirty Bull, uh, the three of us are getting together next week because we, now that we're all next week, we have to brew a collab because that's what we do. Obviously. So we, we will, you know, you heard it here first. We're going to do a collab at, at some point in the summer. Um, but we had done a collab with, with Matt over at uh, Dirty Bull that originated as a recipe that he and I brewed at, when we were homebrewing before there was a very poor glass jug, which was a, at the time, as a homebrew scale, was a 20% alcohol beer. Um, that is definitely illegal. We did not brew that. If anyone from the ABC is listening, we did not <laughs> brew beer at a commercial scale. We brewed a 14.9% um, a ABV, which was just under the law. Um, and so we called it the law. Um, and then we brewed the session version the next year at 14% and called it Lawless because it was slightly less than the law. Um, so Lawless was our big 14% uh, barley wine. So when we brewed a 14% seltzer, we called it Clawless. Um, <laughs> I like it. Yeah. Uh, and, and Mike, who's our, our bar manager now at RTP, he, he made a fun little uh, total spoof logo for Clawless um, that would, would definitely get us a cease and desist. So we did not share that anyway. But yeah, our... that's dangerous. <laughs> we so, have to... that's what we do. So my, my proposal though, you've got opacity, you've got transparency. I feel like the seltzer line has to be clarity, you know, like you've got to, you know, I like that. I, I, we might do that. Uh, I, yeah, I, I hate naming beers. I'm terrible at it. <laughs> and, and I'm, you know, we have a theme, you know, we're trying to do science. We're a beer lab. Um, so we do some fun names. I think we have some good names. But, man, we do so many different beers, it's hard to come up with names. So uh, I might steal yours. <laughs> Go for it. It's yours. All right. Um, so, Chris, thank you so much for, for taking some time and for giving us the tour. Um, tell us a little bit about, A, just generally where people can find Glass Jug Beer and, and come, you know, interact with, with Glass Jug. And when can we come drink at this new taproom? Yeah, that's the million-dollar question, isn't it? <laughs> Um, our, well, I'll answer your first question first. It's easier. Yeah. Where can you get our beer? Um, we have a brewery and tap room and bottle shop in South Durham <laughs> on highway 55. Um, you know, that, that's our home base. It always will be, always, there we go. Always, always has been, uh, we love that part of town. We live right down the street from there. That is where you will always find our beer. Um, we have eight or nine different beers from us on draft bottle shop now. Um, that's your best bet. If you want to come try a bunch of glass jug beers, come there, get a flight. Um, we are in a bunch of places around town. Um, it rotates. Uh, if you're down in the Cary Apex area, Bottle Rev Apex is great. Pharmacy is great. They usually both carry beer pretty regularly on draft. Um, and now that we're going to start canning, we hope to have cans out in all of your favorite bottle shops. You know, around here in Durham, Beer Study, uh, Lou Ella's new shop just picked up mm -hmm. some of our, our cans. Uh, beer Durham, right up the hill from here, carries our cans. So you can find us around, and hopefully you'll find us more now that we're going to be putting out cans more regularly instead of like four times a year. Um, so yeah, we're around, um, you know, we're still small. Like that's, that's still our thing. We still sell 80% through our tap room. So if you really want to find us, come visit us. It'll be your best experience. Not to hate on any of our accounts. They're great, but it's a branded immersive experience. Our bartenders know our beer like nobody else, except for maybe me. Um, but <laughs> you get, you get to say that you're the, you're the one that puts in the hours. Yeah. Um, but yeah, come to our tap room. That's your best bet. And then to answer your second question, um, soon, um, soon, very soon. We have to give you the short spiel um, so we can wrap this up um, yep. and, and me not strangle anybody is uh, we have passed all of our, our final inspections, except um, we are waiting on farm to be put in, um, which should go in any day now. As soon as we get the fire alarm, we can get our ABC permits. Um, all the rest of our work is ready to go. So. Um, we are just waiting on the fire alarm. Otherwise, we have furniture. We have, you know, every, everything's ready. We've got our, our stocking permits. We've got a conditional CO. So we've, we're, we are here as soon as we get that ABC permit, which is, requires us to have that fire alarm, which we have been 
trying very hard to get, but you know, it is what it is. Um, we don't have any leverage, so we're, uh, we're at their mercy. But as soon as we do, then uh, the plan right now is, is to be open next week. We were originally aiming for Monday, seeing as now it is uh, nine o'clock on Wednesday. We'll see about Monday, hopefully Monday. Um, if not, sometime next week, we will be open and, and follow us on social media, you know, the Glass Jug. So at Glass Jug is our brewery account. You can also follow at Glass Jug underscore um, downtown or underscore Durham. See if we're so new, I can't remember our-, uh, our Downtown. Downtown, there we go. Yeah, thank you, Howard. Um, Glass Jug underscore downtown is the new tap room. Uh, Glass Jug underscore RTP is the original bottle shop. So. You can follow all three of our accounts, see what's going on, but definitely we will be posting to the brewery account as well as the downtown account and probably the RTP account to let everyone know once we are open because we want you to come um, at least till we're at 75% capacity, then you'll have to wait. But, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're, we're getting there. No, that's great. And, and look, to anybody who hasn't been or doesn't already know, um, definitely, at least for now, until the, the new downtown location opens, definitely go to RTP. Uh, my wife and I were at the, uh, the beer garden last weekend uh, and uh, can't think of a better place to spend a, a nice afternoon and, and hear some live music or, or come for an outdoor movie. Um, and uh, I, I know I'm speaking for myself and a lot, hopefully a lot of other people that I can't wait to come check out this new tap room and uh, drink a beer on that patio and overlook Durham Central Park. Yeah, do it. And, uh, and yeah, um, I will follow up with what you said. Um, we do have our summer music series kicking off this weekend with Into the Fog, which is one of my favorite bands. They play some great uh, Love those guys. bluegrass. Uh, they're a rock and roll bluegrass band, and they are so much fun. Uh, they're a great time. It's supposed to be like 80 degrees and sunny on Saturday. So bring a lawn chair and a blanket and come hang out with us at RTP, um, assuming we're not going to be open yet here. Um, if we are, come here. But uh, otherwise, we will be rocking and rolling. Bo's Kitchen Food Truck will be out there with uh, awesome, awesome. Saturday. Uh, and yeah, every Saturday we have either live music or an outdoor movie. Um, food trucks every Friday night, trivia on Wednesdays, run club on Tuesdays, you know, there's probably something going on. So yeah, if you need an excuse to come drink beer, we have lots of them. Um, if you just want to drink beer, our downtown tap room right now, we will be serving beer soon. <laughs> I love it. Uh, Chris, thanks again for taking the time for showing us around the new tap room. Uh, and we look forward to uh, seeing you at both locations soon. Yeah, man. I appreciate you doing this. This was a lot of fun. Hopefully we didn't uh, bore everybody and, uh, and we hope to see everyone soon. Sounds great. Cheers. Yeah.